What I was specifically asking about is since this is something that's so controversial that people... Oh, when, oh, when it should if, be taught in schools. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Th like, that's always a hard question because it really depends on what the context of the conversation is. Like, I think that kids in school should know what a gay person is, what a trans person is, and, and what a straight person is, like probably by like grade three, four, or five. But that doesn't mean that we should be having conversations with children about like, you know, this is how gay men have sex. Or like, if you want to be trans, these are the drugs that you need to take. You know, we have to have some awareness of the reality about us, but I, I think that it's hard to make like a blanket rule saying, should we have these conversations or shouldn't we have these conversations? Because I can think of a lot of ways to appropriately have the conversations, and I can think of a lot of ways to inappropriately have the conversations. Uh, but it's also realizing that, you know, if we open the door to start talking to kids about this kind of stuff. It does seem a little bit like grooming or opening kids up to try to teach them a certain way around the world that parents probably disagree with, and I would say is not good to teach a kid under nine years old. I mean, I, so I wholly reject the concept of that this has anything to do with grooming. I, I think that it's okay to be teaching children that like a world exists, and these are the types of people that exist in that world, but it's gonna come down a lot to the types of conversations that are being had. Um, like. I, <laughs> It's the double standards are, are strange sometimes, and, and I understand why. But like, for instance, if we were to talk about certain sexual behaviors between like a teacher and their gay partner, that would be very not okay. But if we were to say like a teacher is saying like, oh yeah, like I, you know, me and my husband are trying to have a kid, which is implying a lot of certain types of sexual acts, um, like that kind of conversation is okay. Um, it's it's a it's a very confusing you know territory to figure out like what kind of conversations are okay, which what aren't. Which is why I like the idea of school boards and parents and teachers coming together and having these conversations, and not some very huge monolith. Um, you know, legislation that's passed on the state level that's trying to figure it out for every single school and then create like a private cause of action for any parent that feels like they've been slighted to sue the school instead of going to the school board and having these conversations. How do you guys were kids? Like the worst things that you were indoctrinated with in school weren't from teachers. It was from that one crazy friend that bought either the magazine or for you guys, I guess they're bringing cell phones with like crazy links to horrible sites or whatever. Like when your kid comes home and he's talking, you know, some crazy shit, it's not because a teacher said it. It's probably because he learned it from his group of friends. And there you have actually like no accountability because you have no idea what they're talking about unless hopefully, you know, either you're, you're communicating with your kid or, you know, the something gets leaked, I guess, to the principal. But to, to summarize, like, there, there, I, I think that there is an important conversation that needs to have between parents and children. I think that is essential. Um, but I don't think we need to, like, ultra-restrict schools. They can only teach these certain things. And uh, if a three-year-old hears that, like, somebody is gay, it's going to, like, ruin them for life. I, I don't agree that that's grooming. I don't think it's going to damage them. I think you can talk to your kid about what's going on, and I think everything will be okay. Maybe you go home and you talk to your parents about it, and then you have these conversations with your children, and you're involved in it. And I, I guess one of the worries that I have on the other end is you get this these parents that are like, we want to shut down all of these conversations. And the goal isn't that they really want to shut down that conversation so they could have it with their kid. The goal is that they want to shut down that conversation so that the kid never has that conversation. The goal isn't I want to expose them to these ideas in an appropriate setting. It's I don't want them ever exposed to these ideas. You know, when I still hear stories about girls that have periods in, in school that have never been told by their moms that like, hey, this is something to be expected, um, it makes me a little bit less sympathetic towards that point of view, but then I guess ultimately depends on, on the parents at the end of the day for how they want to address you know, their child's education. Parents have been fighting everything for their children for since the dawn of time. Um, right now we're talking about the fight against government because I guess we're talking about the fight against schools, which really means we're talking about teachers and talking about certain things for kids. But I mean, like we have fights, I say we, I guess as a parent, yeah, we have fights against like, uh, you know, what are they seeing on the internet? What are they seeing on TV? What are their friends saying to them? Um, you know, what are their uncles or aunts or siblings saying to them? Like, th this, is, this is the nature of parenting. It will never change. Um, and it's how it's always been. You are always going to be fighting for the attention of your child, and you're always going to be fighting against outside forces, trying to influence them to do what they want to do. Um, and it, it just, it's always been the case, you know? Um, you, you, Vietnam riots with college kids, you've got, you know, kids that are rebelling against parents, you've got all the different phases of the emo, the rockers, the punkers, whatever. Like, kids have always been rebelling against parents. Kids have always been influenced by outside media. Kids have always been influenced by other bad friends. Um, that's just, yeah, I, I think that the question isn't, how do we stop the government from influencing our kids? I think the question is more like, like parents need to work on rekindling or rebuilding that bond between 
associating with their child and figuring out what's going on with their child. Um, like I've always said like with my kid, like my goal isn't to make it so that they're never exposed to anything harmful in their life because that's just not possible. The goal is that like I hope that he always feels comfortable talking to me if something comes up. And I think that should be the goal of more parents is that like, hey, like you might get exposed to something that I don't like, you might get exposed to something that you don't like, but I hope that we can have a conversation about it and then I can at least, you know, impart my knowledge on you and I, you're my child, hopefully you listen to me, but I mean you have to make your own decisions eventually and then you kind of move forward that way. You know? This comes down to the conversations between doctors and children. Um, if you've got like a 17 year old guy and he's like, you know, I'm going to identify as female this year and go compete with the women's team, probably not good. Um, but if you've got a child that since puberty seems to be having some issues that aren't alleviated through anything else besides addressing them as a trans person and working you know, through that vector, then I think there are more legitimate arguments, especially when drugs like puberty blockers become involved for these people to participate in sports that more closely resemble uh, you know, their gender identity. Um, I do agree that it is complicated and it is difficult and we need to refine the processes by which we figure out you know, like who is trans. Um, but I think the issue is that there are a lot of people, or, or there, there's the possibility that a person in high school might think they're trans, but they're not actually trans, but if they are trans, they'll definitely think they're trans. So we know that there are people that, especially when puberty is beginning, are going to have these feelings that are never gonna go away. That's not, they're not gonna grow out of that. And then you've got other people that are maybe depressed, maybe anxious, maybe just whatever normal teen stuff um, that they will eventually grow out of, as most do. And I think what we need to do is we need to create an environment where those types of conversations and that type of support can exist, where we're not constantly accusing, you know, everybody of either trying to, you know, groom everybody into being trans, or we're trying to say everybody needs to not be trans, who don't believe in at all. I, I think creating that safe space for those conversations to happen between the families and the doctors and whatever therapy is necessary is the important part to, to kind of figure that issue out. Because I think, I think, I could be wrong, but I think we'd probably agree if we had like a brain scan device and we could push a button and know 100% like at 14, you're trans, you're not, you're trans, you're not, then I think the rest of this conversation becomes a lot easier, right? Like if we know 100% that you're trans and you're going to be trans forever, things like puberty blockers or hormone replacement therapy is probably less controversial. Um, the biggest fear we have is figuring out the, the children that don't know and we don't know how to pursue it. And then people are rightfully, I think, worried that somebody is pushing too hard on either side to either convince somebody that they're trans or say that there's no way they can be trans. I think sometimes when we have these discussions, it's very easy to have this very cold, dispassionate, like, where, you know, where do trans people fit in? How do we figure this out? What, you know, what are we, um, what are we allowing in schools? Um, I think for me, it's important to take a step back and like figure out like, okay, well, like, what are we talking about? Um, at its like purest essence, there's a group of people in the country, in the world, that seem to have some issue going on that has to be addressed. It requires something. Um, otherwise, these people are basically condemned to suffer a great deal of harm for the rest of their lives. So th this is like at the root of the uh, at the root of everything we're dealing with. There's some group of people that, regardless of how we feel about them or how we want to, you know, push them under the rug or how we want to treat them, they're they're going to be suffering t t to some case for their entire life if they don't get treatment. So then the next question becomes, if you believe that we should be creating a society that helps and serves the most people, what can we do for these people? So that's like the lens through which I view all of these things. Even if some of these things become political, even if there are social pressures, even if whatever, at the end of the day, we have to remember there are actual real people that we're talking about, there are real lives that are impacted by this, and we should be making some effort to accommodate, I would hope, as many people in society as possible. Um, you, you mentioned this idea that like, you know, it's uncomfortable that there's this differentiation between sex and gender. I would argue that like that differentiation has always existed. We just, we're just not always cognizant of it because we just assume it's not. You know, there's always like this popular talking point where a conservative will say like, well, what is a woman? What is a man? And you know, if you're trying to be honest, like, okay, well, you know, women, you know, XX chromosomes, they have reproductive organs, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, and you can give this very scientific answer. But if I were to ask you, you know, like, is that a woman or is that a man? You don't know anybody's genes. Um, you can't point to anybody's chromosomes. You don't even know their genitals oftentimes, right? There's actually a ton of like social signaling that we interpret to figure out, you know, like they've got long hair, they've got shaved legs, they wear a certain outfit, um, they, what their name is. And none of these things are like scientifically hardwired to be like that is a sex or that is a gender. So I, I think that we've always kind of been moving around like our understanding of gender. Um, I grew up, uh, I was born in 88, and I know that conservative parents were freaking out when 
white people started to wear jewelry on their earrings, you know, and sync Backstreet Boys. Unforgivable um, sin. Yeah, yeah, people started to get very upset about that. Conservatives got very upset about that. Um, kids started to get longer hair. You know, are you, can you be a man and have long hair? You know, so in terms of like, what is a man, what is a woman for gender presentation, expression, these are things that I think are always moving in society, and they probably always will be. Um, but which do you is, think they're linked, though? I mean, do you think, do you think the, the arguments that were made by radical feminists in the 80s and 90s and onward of this, this uh, gender identity, that we have study departments, I'm not sure if they have it here, but mm -hmm. in this whole exclusionary look at gender outside of sex, knowing that, of course, the variations can exist, people can be more feminine, more masculine, etc., but that there is still this, this link between your genetics, understanding not just your autosomes, but your sex chromosomes help yeah, determine I, that it, expression. It would be an idiot to say that they're not linked at all, obviously. They're for, and for it seems like the vast majority of people, and maybe um, going by your numbers, 99.3% of these people, sex and gender link up directly, um, in that your gender identity, what you feel inside, matches exactly, hopefully, the way that you express yourself. Um, but it seems to be the case that there is a fact of the matter that some people have an incongruence for some reason. Um, now, whether that's environmental, whether that happens because you, you know, your mom fed you out of the wrong breast or whatever, I, you know, who knows what causes it. But um, at some point, it seems like people can develop this idea that they are in the wrong body. And the question goes back to what I said fundamentally, well, what do we do with these people? Because now they're suffering, and now there's gonna be a great deal of harm if you don't alleviate these issues. We've tried conversion therapy for decades. It doesn't seem to work. We tried conversion therapy for, you know, for gay people. It didn't seem to work. Um, I think that that's another thing that uh, w when you bring up this idea between like, do we affirm things or you know, do we, how do we treat them? For a long time, people thought that you know, being homosexual was like a type of delusion or a type of sin. Like if, you, you know, if you're around the right people, you, you, know, you can turn back straight. If we put you into certain camps, you can turn back straight. But I mean, it doesn't work, right? You can't take a straight person and make them gay any more than you could take a gay person and make them straight. So I don't, but I don't see us you know, having the same criticism where we're like, uh, you know, we have to stop affirming gay people with the delusion that they can like men. You know, it seems like you know, gay men like men, and that doesn't seem to be a delusion. It seems to be an accurate representation of what's going on, much the same way that I would say a trans person seems to accurately understand that for whatever reason that the gender that exists in their brain doesn't seem to be the same one that is expressed sexually in their body. Um, I do agree again with what you said about like there is a higher prevalence of like people identifying on trans, I think ContraPoints calls, I think she refers to this as like trans trenders I think is the word she uses. Um, and you know, there, again, there is that weird culture, but I, I would take a step further and say like, I don't really care as much, um, you know, I, the, whatever people identify as a college, like who's getting surgeries, who's detransitioning, like what are the real like on the ground steps? I think that's more important than like obsessing over, you know, whatever the fat is today for college kids. Or, or more importantly, if we are gonna look at that and understand that, okay, maybe there's a problem there, we can't use that problem to then throw all the actual trans people that require some sort of medical or social intervention under the bus. Because it's not fair that some group of like lunatics on a college campus can cause actual real measurable harm to other people just because we don't want to have the intellectual honesty to take a look at the two different uh, groups of people.